And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines presents... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Hume Cronin as star of The One Who Got Away, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live. To your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Hume Cronin in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Well, and I certainly told her, listen here, I said, if you think for one minute that I intend to stand for that sort of thing, you've just... James, you're not listening to me. Put down that paper and listen to me. Yes, dear, I'm listening. So I said, you're very much mistaken. I did not come in here to be insulted. Perhaps you don't know it, young lady, but the war is over. And the sooner you people appreciate that fact, the better it will be for all of us. And Mabel backed me up, too. You bet she did. We went to the manager, and what we didn't tell him about that clerk, we certainly did. Are you listening to me, James? Yes, dear, yes, dear, I'm listening. Well, the nerve trying to tell us that merchandise was hard to get. And so were salespeople. Didn't do him any good, I'll tell you. I'll bet it didn't. What'd you say, dear? I'll bet he must have taken a little more time and trouble hiring clerks, and we got through with them the very idea. It's just like I said to Mabel. It's just like I said. I said, if they have a hat department, they have to sell hats. And if they want to sell hats, they have to allow the customers to try them on. Honestly, if I want to try on hats, it's none of That's their... That's the way it was. I want to try on. Talk, Mabel talk, the talk. Every morning at breakfast, right. every you know night from the minute I got up in the house until I finally got to sleep, every weekend from Saturday morning until Sunday night, talk. Talk, well, talk. Said, we'll just see about this. Even in the movies. You are anyway, I said. Mightn't well, have been so really bad if I'd had a traveling job, but, well, then I didn't have a traveling job. I worked for a bank. I had a job there as a spot auditor. Job was to make spot checks on tellers and cashiers' accounts between the regular audits. The bank had been stuck a couple of times by embezzling tellers. <laughs> no wonder the money they paid. So they fixed up this job making spot checks to catch any funny business before it got very far. All right. I had just as much money as hers. Are you listening to me, James? Yes, dear. I said I was listening. Well, and if my husband gave me as much money for clothes as hers does, I'll bet I could look a whole lot better than she does. Ethel had been talking like that for, oh, ten years. Practically ever since we got married, I guess. And there wasn't anything I could do about it. I'd tried to make her shut up. But she wouldn't. I tried to leave her once, but she followed me and talked and talked until I came back just to shut her up. I couldn't get a divorce. I tried that once. Once. But I couldn't stand this any longer. I had to do something. It seems to me that if you'd only cut down on some of your expenses, we ought to be able to save enough money for a car. Now, I think that I... James... Well, for heaven's sakes, how you startled me, getting up that way. Where are you going, may I ask? I'm just going down to the drugstore for a minute. Well, what do you have to go to the drugstore at this time of night for? Good heavens, I work hard to make a nice home for you, James. I don't see why you're always getting up in the middle of a nice chat to go out. Do you hear me? James, answer my question. Why must you... As soon as I got outside, I felt better. But the thought that I'd have to go back there again, and again, and listen to her talk every day, every night, the thought that I'd have to go back there kept hammering in my head. I suppose I knew what I had to do a long time before that. But I'd never admitted it to myself. There was only one way to shut that woman up. That was to kill her. I didn't sleep very much that night. In the morning, I got up as usual and I went to the bank. I hadn't figured out how to do it yet. What I wanted was an ironclad alibi. I wanted to think some more about it. So for today's spot check, I needed something easy, some accounts that wouldn't give me any trouble. I looked over the bank personnel, wondering which one I should pick. (laughs) And there was my ma'am. Arthur H. Tilworth, the perfect employee. 
looking just like John Q. Taxpayer. Hardworking, conscientious, loyal. Been there for 35 years and risen at last to the eminence of second assistant cashier. Good morning, Mr. Tower. Well, good morning, Mr. Carroll. You passed a restful night, I trust. What? Oh, yes, more or less, Mr. Tilworth. Ah, that's fine. Now, what may I do for you this morning? I thought I'd run a spot check on your accounts today, if you don't mind. Uh, Spot check on my account? There's really no need for that, is there? No, of course not. It's strictly routine. You know that. But but surely there must be others that you have. Oh, uh... come now, Mr. Tilworth. There isn't anything wrong with your accounts, is there? (laughs) Of course not. Of course not. Very well, if you insist. Here are the books, and you may proceed. And so I went to work on Tilworth's accounts. I'd done this sort of thing so often I didn't have to pay much attention to it. And so while I worked, I thought. I thought about Ethel and about an alibi. Well, aren't you fin- uh, uh, finished yet, Mr. Carroll? Closing time, you know. Just about, Mr. Tilworth. Quite a bit of work here. You seem to have handled a lot of transactions last month. Oh, uh, yes, yes, I did. A busy month this last one. Uh, you going home now? No, I think I'll stay here and finish this up. Why don't you finish up in the morning? Oh, this shouldn't take much longer. I'll do it tonight. Very well. Good night, Mr. Good night, Good night, Mr. Tilworth. Huh. It's funny it doesn't balance. Must have made a mistake. Let's see, I'll add it again. <laughs> But it wasn't any mistake. His books didn't balance. And by the time I'd finished the check, I knew he hadn't made a mistake either. Mr. Arthur H. Tilwer, the prize employee of Consolidated National, was deliberately short $3,756.23. When I'd finished, it was quite late. I locked up. But before I started for home and some more talk from my loving wife, I paused for a moment, leaning on the bank doors and lit a cigarette. Something was beginning to stir in my mind. I didn't know quite what, but it was something important. As I was thinking, I happened to glance down the street and I saw somebody coming toward me. I thought the figure looked familiar. Yes. When he passed under the street light, I recognized him. It was Tilworth. I waited for him. Hello, Tilworth. Uh, Mr. Carroll, uh, how are you? You weren't headed for the bank, were you, Tilworth? Well, uh, well, yes. As a matter of fact, I was. Uh, Some work I wanted to clean up. Yeah, I can imagine. Never mind about that now, Tilworth. You can't clean it up. Come on, come on down the corner and have a cup of coffee with me. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. I think you'd better come along. See, I want to talk to you. No, really, Mr. Carroll, I don't think that I... Look here, Tilwer, I have a report in my pocket concerning your accounts. You just might like to see it before I turn it in. All right. I'll come. Just for a moment. Let's go. I got Tilwer into a booth and ordered two cups of coffee and handed him a carbon copy of the report. He read it all the way through. And the further he read, the whiter his face got. Stop shaking and give me that before you spill your coffee. Now, there are a couple of things I want to know before I turn this in. What have you done with the money? Uh, Mr. Carroll, I I have a sister. She's desperately ill. Every penny of that money has gone for her treatments. Every penny. That isn't going to make any difference. Embezzlement's embezzlement. She'll die. She'll die, Mr. Carroll. I didn't mean to steal that money, and I'll pay it back. Yeah, Please yeah, don't yeah. turn in that report. My, my sister will die if I can't continue her treatments. I'll find some way to pay it back. That's really what will. they all say, Tilworth. Mr. Carroll, I've lived a life of probity and honesty for 50 years. I only did this because I couldn't bear to see my sister die for lack of money. I had to have it. You must help me. I must help you. Do you realize what you're asking me to do? Yes, I realize it. Surely there's some way I can make it worth your while. I haven't any money, but I'd do anything for you. Absolutely anything. Don't, don't turn in that report. Then it came to me. This was it. You don't realize it. The perfect alibi. Tilwer would provide it. Tilwer would have to provide it. I listened to him run on until I'd thought it all out. And she thinks I have some money. All right, Tilwer. All right, all right. I'll help you. 
On certain conditions. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Carroll. You don't realize... What... First, I... First, I want a written confession from you. Just in case. And then I want you to be prepared to swear that I was with you all evening on one night that I'll pick out. You understand? Oh, yes. Yes, I'll do it. Anything. Anything at all. Good. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Hume Cronin in The One Who Got Away. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. Traditional as going to the big game are those friendly get-togethers and fireside reunions afterwards. If you're playing host this weekend, enrich your hospitality by serving delicious Roma wines. For Roma California sherry, port, or muscatel, add warmth and friendliness to any occasion. And because Roma wines taste better, more Americans serve Roma than any other wine. Roma wines do taste better because Roma master vintners start with California's choicest grapes. Then, with America's finest winemaking resources, they patiently guide this glorious grape goodness to tempting taste perfection. Later, along with Roma wines of years before, this abundant treasure awaits selection from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. Take advantage of Roma's present low prices. Buy Roma by the case for your holiday needs and save. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's favorite wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Hume Cronin as James Carroll in The One Who Got Away, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The next night, I didn't come home until almost 8 o'clock. Ethel was in fine form. She started right in. Carol, where have you been? You know I'm supposed to meet Mabel at the corner at 8.15 to catch the bus downtown to the show. I should think you'd show a little consideration for me once in a while. Well, answer me. Where have you been? I'm sorry, dear. I'm sorry. I had to work late, and I didn't have a chance to call you. What do you mean you didn't have a chance to call me? Now your dinner's all cold. You just have to eat it that way, too. I can't wait around here any longer. That's all right, dear. I, I'll tell you what. You go and get your things on. I'll call Mabel and tell her that you're going to be a little late. She won't have left yet. Uh, you haven't called her yet, have you? Oh, well, no, I haven't called her already. I've been doing nothing but wait for you. All right, dear, I'll call her now. You go and get your things out. Well, all right, but in the future, James Carroll, when you know I'm going out, I want you here on time. Hello? That you, Tilbert? You alone? You expect anybody tonight? That's fine. Listen, Tilbury, this is the night. Yeah. I want you to say that I've been there with you all evening from 7 o'clock on. Never mind why. I'll be over there after a while, and I'll give you the details of what you're to say when the time comes. Okay, I, I, don't know what I've ever done I don't care whether you like it or not, Tilly. No, not yet, dear. Not yet. Just a moment. You don't want your sister to die, do you? Do you? All right, I'll see you shortly. Did you get her? Did you get her, Jane? No, I didn't. The uh, phone was busy. Oh, what do you mean the phone was busy? I heard you talking to somebody. Oh, well, that was somebody else. Oh, well, honestly, this is most annoying. I don't believe you can do anything right. Give me that phone. Yes, dear, here you are. Well, really, can't even dial, for heaven's sake. Oh, I don't know. Hello? Uh, Hello, Charlie? Charlie, this is Ethel. Yeah. Has Mabel left yet? Oh, good, yeah. Let me talk to you, will you please? Yeah. Hey, James, don't just stand there behind me like that. You know how nervous it makes me. Uh, Mabel? Mabel, this is Ethel. Listen, hon. Hon, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be just... A, I'm just going to be a tiny bit late. Yeah? Oh, I'll catch the next bus, sure. Well, it, it's really very annoying. I, I had a... Ch- a uh, oh. <laughs> I 
guess I must have got back not very long after the cops got there. The apartment was ablaze with lights. There was a cop at the door. Inside, there were photographers, fingerprint men, all the usual array of the law. The detective in charge was named Dolan. Pretty much of an average-looking guy, but sharp. We went through the amenities, and he told me how sorry he was. I expressed my shock and horror, and finally we got down to business. Mr. Carroll, I hate to bother you at a time like this, but uh, I find it quite helpful in cases of this kind to talk to people as soon as possible. Yeah, yes, I understand. Now, uh, when did you last see your wife alive, Mr. Carroll? Why, uh, about a quarter to seven, I guess. I only came in for a moment, and she was getting ready to go out. Hmm? Huh? About a quarter to seven. And she was okay when you left? Yes, perfectly. And you say you left the apartment then? That's right. Where'd you go, Mr. Carroll? Well, what's that got to do with it? Oh, Mr. Carroll, this is a murder case. Your wife was strangled while she was talking over the phone to a friend of hers. You want to bring her murderer to justice, don't you? Well, of course. Well, in a case like this, unless we get a break, we'll have to investigate the whereabouts of a great many people at the time she was killed. We'll find out a lot of things that people would prefer to keep quiet. Now, perhaps what you were doing after you left here is something like that. But let me assure you, if where you were and what you were doing has nothing to do with this case, it'll never come out. Now, where were you? I, uh... I, was it uh, to see a woman, Mr. Carroll? Oh, no. No, there was no other woman. Don't you remember where you went? Yes. Yes, I remember. Well, why won't you tell me? Mr. Carroll, where did you go after you left this apartment at a quarter of seven? I'm not going to tell you. Hmm? Huh? Mr. Carroll, why did you kill your wife? I didn't kill her. What's the matter with you? You didn't kill her. You left her here alive at a quarter of seven, and you won't say where you went. But that's right. But I didn't kill her. Why should I? Look here, I, I love my wife. Mr. Carroll, I'm afraid you leave me no choice. I must ask you to accompany me down to headquarters. <laughs> Down at headquarters, we went through it all over again, and again, and again. In the end, always the same three questions, and always the same three answers. Why did you kill your wife, Carol? I didn't kill her. Where did you go that night? I won't tell you. Why won't you tell us where you went? I won't tell you that. The same three questions, and the same three answers. Over and over and over, for a long, long time. Over and over and over. But I never told them. The case came up for trial about two months later. The prosecution had a good sound case for first-degree murder, and the district attorney made the most of it. It looked open and shut until the last witness for the defense... The last, the only witness for the defense, Arthur Tilworth, took the stand. On the evening of the 14th of September, I went straight home from the bank and had dinner. At about two minutes past seven o'clock, I remember the time exactly because my favorite radio program at the Symphony Hour had just come on, the defendant, Mr. James Carroll, joined me and remained in my presence until about 11 o'clock. Order in the court! Order in the court! Order! They went at him hammer and tongs. Kept him on the stand for an hour and a half. But he never changed his story and never contradicted himself. He made as admirable a witness as he did a bank employee. The jury was out for a long time. Twelve hours or so. And when they came back... Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Do you find the defendant, James Carroll, guilty as charged or not guilty? Not guilty, Your Honor. Oh, oh, and there it was, just the way I'd planned it. I was free. And I'd stay free. No man, the law says, shall be placed twice in jeopardy for the same offense. No matter what they found out, they couldn't touch me now. I was free of Ethel forever. (laughs) 
After it was over, I took about a week off. I got a cabin up in the hills, and I just loafed around for a whole week. All by myself. It was nice and quiet. Nice and quiet. When I got back to the apartment, I saw someone standing by my door. It was Dolan. Hello, Carol. Hello, Dolan. Want to see me? Yeah. Just for a minute. I, uh... I've been away for a week, you know. Yeah, we know. Come on in. Thanks. Sit down. Thanks. Uh, cigarette? Cigar? No, I don't think so. Thanks, anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, Dolan, what do you want? Oh, nothing, really. Look, Dolan, is this supposed to be a purely hey, social Hey, Carol, visit? tell me, do you fish? Do I fish? No. Why? Fishing is my favorite sport. I was raised around Winnipeg Lake, you know. Fishing's fine there. Yeah? There's one particular spot on Winnipeg that's a favorite of a lot of fishermen. It's deep, cool, and rocky. There was a big speckled bass lived there. Very cagey creature he was, too. A lot of fellows thought they had him. Hooked him even. But he... Always got away. This is all very interesting, but if you don't As a mind, matter I... of fact, that fish got to be quite famous. Got to be known as the one who got away. And every time anybody did any serious fishing there, they'd always have a try at landing. Oh, yeah, they tried everything. All sorts of flies and lures and bait. Went on for years. Look here, Dolan, I don't know what you want from me, well, but I... Well, I... I gotta go now, Carol. It's a fascinating story, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Very. By the way, Carol, you know how much that fish weighed? Seven pounds and twelve ounces. How do you know? We got a little careless one day. Took a long time, but I finally got him. Bye now, Carol. I could see that Dolan was going to be annoying. But I didn't care. I figured he'd stop after a while. There was only one more thing I had to do to clean this whole thing up. I'd made a bargain with Tilwer, and I intended to keep it. Yes, sir, I, I'm a man that keeps his bargains. That night I went around to his apartment. There was no answer when I knocked. I noticed that the door was unlatched, and so I pushed it open. There was Tilwer sitting in the dark by the window, just staring out. The flicker of the neon signs outside lit his face as they flickered on and off. He looked about 150 years old. Tilwer. Hey, Tilwer. Tilwer. What are you doing sitting there in the dark? Come on, let's have some light. Just sitting here thinking, Carol. Thinking? About what? About a lot of things. Principally about you. Huh? Look, Tilwer, I made a bargain with you and I've come to keep it. Yes, sir. Here's your confession. Here are both copies of my report. Tilwer, did you hear me? I said here was the confession. Yes, I heard you. It doesn't matter. What do you mean, it doesn't matter? You want to go to jail, Tilwer? And how about your sister? My sister's dead this morning. Oh, I'm sorry, Tilwer. You made me kill your wife, Carol. What? Oh, Oh, come now, Tilwer. Don't be stupid. I did you a favor. You did me one. That's that. No, if it hadn't been for me, your wife would still be alive. And I've been punished for my sins. My sister. Oh, Lord. But you, who will punish you for your sins, Carol? Take it easy. You killed and you cheated justice. But you won't cheat me because I'm going to kill you. Sit down, you old fool. Get away from that knife. Get away from that knife, I tell you. All right. Give it to me. Give it to me. Or... Now, sit down. Oh, that's better. Quite a nasty little pig sticker you have here, Tilwer. There's your knife, my decrepit avenging angel. You're not going to kill anybody. I'll get you, Carol. You'll see. I'll get you, you murdering... Yeah. Yeah. 
Who's there? Just a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Hold on. I'm coming. Hello, Carol. What do you mean by getting me out of Where bed? Where were at this you I... last night, Carol? Who wants to know? The police department wants to know. Now answer my question. Where were you last night? Or uh, aren't you saying? Certainly I'm saying. I went over to see Tilworth. Anything wrong with that? And how was Tilworth? Why, you're all right, about the same as usual. And how was he when you left him? He was just the same as when I came in. What is Was he? This? Of course he was. What's wrong? Something wrong with Tilworth? He's dead, Carol. Dead? There was a knife in his heart. A knife? There were fingerprints on that knife, Carol. Oh, oh It was no, in his no. heart, and your fingerprints were on it, Carol, and on the door and on the lamp. No, 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 no listen, I didn't kill him, I tell you. This is a frame up. Maybe, it, but I the didn't police touch him. I was. is taking a different view, Carol. Get but some you... clothes on. You're under arrest for the murder of Arthur Tilworth. Oh no, no. Too bad you'll never get to see that fish I was telling you about. It's over my fireplace, just hanging there. Come on, Carol. <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wine. This is Ken Niles introducing our suspense star of the evening, one of Hollywood's most accomplished villains, Hume Cronin. Tell me, Hume, wouldn't you like to give up roguery and play a nice guy just once? <laughs> Not me, Ken. Look what happens to the nice guys on suspense. They always get killed in the first act. <laughs> give me a cloak and dagger any time. Well, as far as you're concerned, then, villainy is its own reward. That's it. My sentiments to a teaser. A uh, 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 tea party doesn't go on this program, Hume. But since you're a party to suspense this evening, this goes to you. Roma presents you with this gift basket of Roma wines selected for you... From the world's greatest wine reserve. Why, thank you, Ken. And thanks to Roma, too. My. For a man of my moderate tastes, Roma wine's an ideal gift. And for moderate entertaining, Hume, you can't beat the Roma Muscatel in your gift basket. Share with your guests the golden richness of Roma Muscatel, delicious with cake or nuts. Or enjoy delightful Roma Muscatel with dessert. Let the naturally sweet, mellow taste of Roma Muscatel enrich your quiet evenings at home. Roma Muscatel, that sounds very tempting. Oh, it is, Hume. And Roma Muscatel tastes better because Roma starts with California's choicest grapes, guides them skillfully with America's finest winemaking resources to tempting taste perfection. Later, at peak richness, Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. That's the reason more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And reason enough, too. And now, Ken, uh, before I go home and murder my wife again, uh, who's slated for the spotlight on suspense next Thursday? It's yours and mine and everybody's dream girl, Hume. Judy Garland. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, what kind of a play will Judy do? Well, we don't want to tip too much of it, but Judy will appear as a girl who works as a waitress in one of our Hollywood drive-ins and who gets into a situation that is, believe me... Well calculated to keep you in suspense? <laughs> right. I'll certainly be listening. Good night, Ken. Good night, Hume. Hume Cronin appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor production The Yearling. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Judy Garland as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, uh-huh.